For Criminal Media's Polity, I'm Tabi Madiba, HSRC CEO Crane Sodin, joins me to discuss his book titled The Cape Radicals, Intellectual and Political Thought of the New Era Fellowship, 1930s to 1960s. The story of the Cape Radicals is one of the great untold tales of South African politics. What inspired you to tell the story? Precisely because uh, of its uh, untold nature. Um, I have a long personal association with this history, um, uh, going back to when I first came to university uh, in Cape Town in the, uh, in, the, in the 1970s. And so I was part of a community of people uh, at the university uh, that, um, and this group of people were deeply influenced by this history. It was evident in the way in which these young people that I came to meet there, I came from Johannesburg and so I came here to Cape Town and it was a real cultural shock for me that I had known so little about these people and yet they were so articulate, so uh, analytic, and so it was a, a really important part of my personal life. Uh, but then also, um, uh, about three or four years ago, um, the people who are associated with this political movement approached me and asked if I wouldn't write a uh, history for them about the origins of this particular movement. Briefly talk to us about the formation of the New Era Fellowship, a remarkable public education and cultural project. So it comes out of a political uh, dynamic. Um, so Cape Town, and I suppose the colonies largely, the British colonies, were very influenced by the cultural politics of what was happening in, in Britain um, from about the early 1900s. And so a major feature of British life in that particular period was the stimulation of educational opportunities for working class people. So you have in England um, and all over Britain the emergence of cultural clubs um, trade union clubs, where they uh, begin to, in those clubs, uh, provide uh, formal and also informal education to people. Parts of the University of London were dedicated to uh, helping the establishment of these clubs. Um, but. Uh, these clubs occupied a whole range also of political uh, expressions from right-wing clubs to left-wing clubs to clubs that were associated with uh, the churches the temperance movement for example which was all about getting people to stop drinking uh, come out of this particular uh, range of societies so, so there were all kinds of societies so this particular society was a left society. Uh, it, it, it came out of the political dynamics of uh, working class uh, organization in Cape Town in the, in the 1930s. In that community of the working class in, the, in Cape Town in the 1930s, there was a big debate going on uh, between people who were essentially uh, associated with uh, uh, the Communist Party in Russia, the, the socialist movement, the Comintern, and other socialists who were associated with Leon Trotsky. And these socialists were in big debate and big argument. And so they come to establish their own rival cultural clubs uh, in big cities like Johannesburg and Cape Town. In Cape Town, uh, you have the emergence of the New Era Fellowship. And this New Era Fellowship is an anti-Stalinist, an anti Communist Party initiative and it's really about trying to bring progressive education to the working class, to the working peoples of Cape Town. And what role did the New Era Fellowship play in contributing to South Africa and global politics? Big. 
really big. So it's through a curious coincidence of all sorts of, of, of factors, which I suppose only South Africa in the world at that particular time would have been receptive to, uh, that, that South Africa at that particular place in time was a place to which political refugees from Europe fled, uh, particularly against the persecution of Jews in the 1920s and the 1930s. And one of the places they come to in the world is Cape Town. And, and this is the magic in some ways of South Africa. They meet South Africans uh, who are uh, also involved in, in thinking about liberation, and thinking about the struggle against colonialism and racism. And so you have yeah, this, these people coming together and they begin to analyze what race is in ways that are not evident anywhere else in the world at that time. And that's the, that's, that's the incredible thing coming out of, out of all of this. It's an uh, intervention in intellectual and political thinking around these questions of the role of race globally, uh, which takes fruit and root in South Africa in a way that is not evident uh, anywhere else in the world. It's only like 30 or 40 years later that this insight that these people come up with through these, this, this, this new era of fellowship is evident anywhere else in the world. And it's absolutely extraordinary. I mean, this is why uh, this, this, this story about these people is so, so important to us. They come to present to us this explanation of non-racialism, right? And non-racialism is a very different idea to the way in which non-racialism is current, is used at that particular time. At that particular time, the word is there, the term is there, non-racialism is there, but it's not used in the sense in which these people use it. And talk to us about the importance of the discussions on race and class and the impact it had on the New Era Fellowship. So the big contribution that they make and this is the novelty, this is the newness of all of this. The big insight to, to which they come is that the idea of race is a lie. You know, that the idea of race is an invention of hegemony, of the ruling class. That race is something that was invented to justify exploitation of black people. And they come to make this extraordinary explanation that biologically there's no difference between human beings. And you can just imagine, they're saying it in, in the 1940s, they're saying it in an environment in which apartheid is just about to burst onto the social scene in South Africa uh, with the Fervurts and the Jeffrey Croniers who say now that South Africa is made up of these races and they are distinct uh, in their biologies, they are distinct uh, in their uh, uh, physical makeups, and these distinctions are material. These distinctions matter. So here you have in South Africa, right, this apartheid thing, which comes to uh, rest this whole architecture which governs our lives for the next 45 years. For the next 45 years, everything about everyday life, about every single moment of people's lives is based on that particular uh, scientific analysis. And at that same time, these people are saying that all of that is a lie. It's nonsense. It doesn't exist. It's in people's heads. Briefly explain to us why the New Era Fellowship was established when there was already a Spartacus Club. It, it was established in that particular way because the Spartacus Club was a straight political organization. It was a club for this Workers' Party. The New Era Fellowship tried to avoid that political association in a way which would invite the attention of the police, which, which would invite the attention of the authorities and so on. So they tried to make it less threatening in the way in which a political organization uh, might be. So it emerges as a cultural club for anybody. And it, you know, so it doesn't have, as the, as the Spartacus Club, the Spartacus Club would have been governed by 
and the strict discipline and the rules of the political organization. It would, it would be like the ANC's political schools, right? I mean, that's what the Spartacus clubs, those, 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 those clubs would have been. You would have had to be a member of, of the South African Workers' Party to be a member of, of the Spartacus uh, clubs. This is them taking this education to, if you like, the people, the masses, uh, and it in, in in that sense is a, a a deliberate pedagogical kind of step to uh, uh, promote to disseminate ideas in a way in ways that the Spartacus Club would not have been able to. Tell us more about Gulam Gul, one of the people behind the formation of the NEF and the role he played in shaping the club. So these are people in our history we know very little about. You know, we, we know so little about these extraordinary characters who are so influential in our, in our political history. So Gulam Gul was a doctor. Um, he and his brother were trained as doctors uh, in the UK at that time. You know, and none of the universities in South Africa were prepared to uh, admit black students. So first time that happens is about 1945 when a student comes to uh, Witts and then 1946 another stu black student, student start coming to uh, UCT. So during all of that time, uh, black people who were doctors were trained uh, outside of the country. Gulam Gul uh, went to receive his medical training uh, at Guy's Hospital in London. His brother at the same time, a little older than him, went to Edinburgh University. These people come back to South Africa. Gulam Gul comes back in 1929. In 1929, he meets these incredible other intellectuals, activists at UCT. Uh, amongst them is a man called Lancelot Hogben. Lancelot Hogben is this absolutely phenomenal biologist who is teaching at UCT. Uh, and he is most famous for pointing out that this post-Darwinism stuff about eugenics, which tried to prove that black people have smaller brains than white people, he was teaching this at UCT at that time. And UCT didn't like all of that, so they kicked him out. So here Gulam Gul is in the company of these people, like Hogben. And Gulam Gul becomes a member of the South African Workers' Party and begins to have the responsibility in that Workers' Party. And this is the amazing thing about these people, uh, in all of these debates that people are having, they have this discussion about what is the nature of, of the political struggle in South Africa. You know, how, how do we come to explain the sociology of South Africa? Uh, and it's in that environment that people like Gulam Gul begin, and this is around about 1935, 1936, 1937, begin to think about uh, what race means, what class means, and to some degree also what gender means. Uh, and to begin to explain the significance of race, class, and gender in South Africa. It's absolutely, this is absolutely phenomenal stuff. It's phenomenal because uh, uh, South African sociology South African history, South African political studies at that particular time is drenched in this discourse of race. And the uh, academics in these universities are largely focused on trying to show the differences between races, you know, so-called races. Um, some of them are preoccupied, and this is these paleontologists and archaeologists and anthropologists at UCT preoccupied with proving the point that black people are inferior to white people, that black people have smaller brains than white people. And into the steps, you know, in these small kinds of ways, these people like Gulam Gul, who have learned from people like Hogben, and they begin to tell another story about the sociology of South Africa. You know, that South Africa is more complicated than this racist sociology uh, and this racist politics and this racist history. And Gulam Gul is a very charismatic figure. Uh, you know, he's a very popular doctor, but he enters this new era fellowship 
uh, he's instructed in some ways to establish this new era fellowship by his workers' party. And there at this workers' party, they begin opening up these public debates about race. They have a big debate in 1938 about, about what race is. And there, for the first time, uh, reading the literature globally on the, you know, they begin to start articulating the story that, you know, that race is actually a whole lot more complicated than we've been taught. And who were some of the other individuals who played an important role in Cape radicalism? So the, the, there are a, a whole lot of them. The, the two of them that, again, that our history has very little experience of them. One of them is Ibi Tabata, who comes from the Transkei to work in Cape Town in uh, the, the Lorry Drivers Union. He left uh, Forte and he comes to Cape Town in 1934-35. I mean, Ibi Tabata is an amazing, absolutely amazing South African intellectual. He writes a really critical book um, which many historians might know of but um, uh, which to this day you know young people would, would have no knowledge of it, it's called education for barbarism right and he writes this book in the about early 1950s and he is a major organizer in what becomes the non-european unity movement so he is one of them the other one is a man called Ben Kiss the younger of these three musketeers uh, of Gulam Gul, Tabata, and the third one is Ben Kiss. Ben Kiss is not yet 21 uh, when the New Era Fellowship is established in, in 1937. He was born in 1917. So he's about 10 years younger than Gulam Gul and, 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 and Tabata, but he's very influenced by them. They're his mentors, but it is he in some ways who takes the intellectual tradition uh, which comes out of their work furthest. Um, he gives three lectures, three big lectures. A first lecture in 1943 called The Background to Seg Segregation. A second lecture in 1945 uh, uh, called The Basis of Unity. Uh, and a third lecture in 1953 uh, called The Contribution of the Non-European Peoples to World Civilization. And it's these three lectures that effectively come to articulate uh, the ideas of, of, of these people, these three musketeers, right? Um, uh, and uh, it's 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 around them that this this tradition, which comes out of the New Era Fellowship, effectively uh, is is created and, uh, in a sense, uh, distributed, is disseminated into not just Cape Town, you know, but uh, to, to the to the wider country. Uh, the, but but there are lots of other people. There are lots of other people uh, around them. An important point to make about these people, uh, right up until their deaths, uh, um, um, is, is that they uh, were not populists, so they didn't like uh, self-promotion. You know, they didn't like this whole practice of the leader, the great man. And so, uh, they, they, they regularly and frequently, uh, 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 in a sense, sank into the collectives of which, um, of which they were a part. When they spoke about the organization, they spoke about the collective. You know, they didn't, didn't promote themselves. And this is partly why we don't know so much about them. And lastly, what are some of the reasons why Cape cultural renovation struggled to grow into the mass movement that some hoped it might yes. be? Yes, no, no, that's a really important question. The reason why it doesn't grow into a populist movement is because of the difficulty of the message that they were trying to convey. Trying to tell people at that particular point that race is a lie is such a difficult thing. You know, when people's whole identities uh, when people's whole sense of who they are is shaped by this thing of colour and race, going to tell people that you've been sold a lie here by the ruling class is not something that people are easily going to uh, take to. And so the message 
this is not something that uh, uh, is part of this criticism of them. The criticism of them, um, which is uh, what is often drawn on to explain their lack of success, is that they were armchair politicians. You know, they didn't want to engage in mass struggle, right? They refuse to take their struggle to the people. So you may want to say that there's that explanation, but my explanation is that their message was too difficult. It was too difficult. You know, it, it, was, it was really difficult. Even when they try to f form these clubs, these cultural clubs, so they succeed to a, to a large degree. But it's something that, that you need to teach people in an absolutely with logical way which gives you some sense of breaking down of how you're going to break down these things when somebody says to you that I'm a I'm a, I'm a tosser, right you know I'm, I'm a tosser, you know I'm mean, how do you say to a person actually or if a person says you know I'm 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 white how do you say to a person that that's actually not such an important thing in your life you know, there are many more important things about you. Uh, the colour of your skin is not the first thing that comes to determine your capacity as a human being. You know, giving that message to people is an enormously difficult thing. You know, uh, when you've been told, when you see around you that it matters. So the big thing that I want to say to you in closing is that they were very aware of racism. They were very aware of how racism works, right? And they were totally preoccupied with challenging racism, with challenging the effects of racism. But the way in which they had to do that was to say to people that this thing of race, which is different to racism, this thing of race is a nonsense. Racism depends on this lie of race. You know, just articulating that and giving it a way of helping a child to begin to think about who or sh he or she might be is a really hard thing to convey, to put across. So that's, that's, that's a an explanation you know, that I would like to uh, you know, kind of add to this thing about, uh, and to even qualify this thing that these were armchair politicians. You know. and so, the thing to say to you in closing, and this is the last thing to say to you, is that personal politics, this is what it comes down to, is a really hard thing to manage you know, in, one's, in oneself. Living, living this thing about being a complete human being, uh, unconditionally human, so if anybody says you know, to them, who are, you know, how would you explain uh, human beings, they would you know, start by saying, you know, human beings are really complicated things. Uh, there are many, many things that come to shape who a human being uh, is, uh, and the things that human beings choose to define, to project, to identify with, uh, are the things of dominant society. And these people who are going to say that I don't wish to be part of that. I don't wish to be part of that, that dominance. And this is what this new era is all about. There's a new era for human beings. And we human beings need to step into this new era and to imagine ourselves into this new era as full human beings who are unconditionally entitled to all the rights of dignity uh, and self-worth. That was Crane Sodin speaking to Krima Media's policy about the Cape Radicals.